when we look out in the universe around us, when astronomers use their telescopes and make observations, there's a striking pattern, there's structure in the universe. We see structure on all different scales. We see huge, dense glommings together of matter and activity and energy in super clusters of galaxies, separated by huge voids where not much is going on. That's true if we zoom in and look even on shorter distance scales, like the solar system, there's big clumps of stuff and then huge spaces in between. That's certainly true even here on Earth, of course. And so one of the questions driving uh, physics and astronomy for many years has been, wh what's the origin of that structure? Why is there this pattern, this lumpiness and these voids? What might explain that? It turns out if for some reason there had been tiny little lumps to begin with, then we could account for the kinds of patterns we see today. Uh, gravity would just make small initial lumps where there was a little bit more stuff than average here than here. Over time, gravity would make those lumps attract more matter to it, and those, would be, those lumps would become lumpier, the voids become more and more empty. But that explanation depends on accounting for the initial lumps, where that first little bumpiness or lumpiness come from. And it turns out our best explanation to date combines two of the most brilliant and beautiful ideas at the heart of modern physics. Uh, one, a notion from Einstein's relativity, that space-time is wobbly, it's like a trampoline, that the space and time in which we are embedded is not static or fixed, it can respond to the presence of matter in it. That's one idea. And the other, coming from quantum theory and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, is that matter is inherently jittery. It can't help but fluctuate around. We start combining those two ideas, and all of a sudden we can begin to account for the origin of this structure in the universe. So uh, we can start then with Einstein's relativity, the wobbly or, or wiggly space-time. So as Einstein taught us about 100 years ago, space-time uh, is a lot like a trampoline. Imagine a, a stretchy trampoline and we put a big heavy ball in the middle of it. The surface of that trampoline will begin to warp. It'll, it'll bend in the presence of that mass. As Einstein taught us, space and time themselves act just like that trampoline. So that's how we account for the motion of the planets near the solar system to exquisite detail. Uh, the big mass of the sun deforms the space-time around it, and planets move along in that warped, uh, on that warped uh, surface. It also turns out that space and time can stretch. They might not just get uh, bent here and now, they could change over time. The universe could expand, it could shrink or contract, and the rate at which it changes, the stretchiness, the expansion, depends on the type of matter that's filling the universe. So if the universe were filled with a hot gas, like the inside of a hot air balloon, then the universe would expand at a certain rate. It would get bigger at a certain rate. If the universe were filled with kind of cold rocks with like lumpy planets like the Earth, uh, then the universe would expand at a different rate. If the universe were filled mostly with a certain kind of matter, much like the Higgs field, the Higgs boson that's recently been found at the Large Hadron Collider outside Geneva, if it's filled with that kind of matter, it can actually behave very differently. If that's the matter that dominates the kind of energy balance of the universe, then space-time can rip apart, can grow exponentially quickly. And so, in fact, uh, there's been a, a lot of work now for decades on a model called cosmic inflation, which extrapolates from what we know about the behavior of matter, uh, extrapolates that to, to, to conditions very early after the Big Bang, when the universe was, was very new. And from that, we can begin to, to piece together to try to deduce what the universe should look like today. So now we know there is such a thing as the Higgs field. We've, people have found it. They've actually um, detected the Higgs particles. It turns out it beca it's, it's more and more likely that as we go to earlier times, especially the earliest moments after the Big Bang, that matter, like the Higgs field, should have dominated the overall composition of the universe. That should have been most uh, important in terms of the way the energy of the universe was distributed. Either the exact Higgs field that they've just found or fields very much like it. Simplest kind of mathematical structure, uh, not like the kind of particles that make up us, not like electrons or quarks or protons, even simpler, much like that Higgs field they've just found. Well, those so-called scalar fields are capable of storing an enormous amount of energy in them and so much so that they should have dominated the energy balance of the entire universe at the earliest moments after the Big Bang. When that happens, space grows exponentially quickly. Space should grow a billion, billion, billion times in the blink of an eye. It just should go exponentially like that. So inflation starts predicting very specific things about the universe that we should observe today. If that story 
happened if the universe was once filled and dominated by Higgs-like fields, and the universe stretched like that, then we should see a certain kind of shape to the universe today. So Einstein's relativity, that trampoline story, allows space to have many different kinds of shapes. It could be shaped like the surface of a ball. It could, have a, it could be bent toward itself. It could be stretched away from itself, like the surface of a horseback riding saddle. Or it could be perfectly flat, like a perfectly flat uh, sheet of paper. Einstein's theory doesn't tell us which version we should find. And in fact, if we start thinking about the usual Big Bang model, we should be least likely to find that third option, that sort of flat option, where space looks most like the geometry we all learned in high school, most like a flat piece of paper. That's actually an unstable solution to Einstein's equations. So if, if space had been ever so slightly different from flat at early times, it should be wildly different from that today. Instead, when we look around, uh, we measure the universe to be remarkably flat. It, and so how to account for that? It turns out if the universe had been filled by this Higgs-like matter, this scalar field matter, in its earliest moments uh, in time, and went through that stretching, then we would have to measure a flat universe today. We it would be like taking a basketball and expanding it a billion, billion, billion times so that now we no longer notice the curvature. When we, when we sample any little portion of it, it would look remarkably flat to us, much like when we walk down our street, we don't notice the curvature of the Earth because we're comparing scales that are so wildly different. So inflation makes a prediction the universe today should be flat, not some of these other options that Einstein's relativity would otherwise have allowed. Well, it turns out it does more than that. Not only should that Higgs-like matter have driven this huge expansion, the Higgs field itself should be subject to the uncertainty principle, just like all matter is. That's an inherent jitteriness, a kind of uh, matter that just sort of can't sit still at the atomic level. There should be uh, inherent quantum fluctuations. So the Higgs field, we think, dominates the balance of energy at these early moments, but it doesn't have the exact same amount of energy everywhere at once. There might, there's an average value and then tiny little ripples or jiggles away from that average value as we probe different areas in space, unavoidably so. That's what the uncertainty principle tells us must be true for any kind of matter. So now we take these tiny sort of atom or smaller than atom sized wiggles, variations in space, and they get stretched just like everything else during that period of inflation. They get stretched by a factor of a billion, billion, billion. So now what had been tiny wiggles on the scale of an atom or smaller than an atom are now stretched to the size of a galaxy or beyond. So all of a sudden we have unavoidable jitteriness from this quantum state of matter that's now stretched to huge astronomical scales, large enough to start seeding structure like structures of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and so on. So if that whole story were, were the origin of structure, there should be very specific properties to the patterns of those wiggles. Turns out the wiggles get um, imprinted in space-time. So we have little jittery matter on that trampoline that sets up wiggles on the surface of the trampoline, little, little wave-like ripples. And those in turn get imprinted in the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB, a kind of remnant glow left over from very soon after the Big Bang. And that's what now generations of satellites as well as Earth-based uh, observations can measure the, the ripples in that cosmic microwave background to extraordinary precision. Uh, when the astronomers measure those ripples, the patterns of the ripples, they match the predictions of inflation to an extraordinary degree. Not only should there be ripples at all, but the statistical properties match what one predicts from first principles, from that story of a Higgs field undergoing quantum fluctuations. There should be a very slight tilt, so that wiggles that are on a longer wavelength should have a slightly greater height, larger amplitude, than wiggles that are on shorter wavelengths, to an degree that matches uh, the calculations uh, to, to an astonishing degree. So we can zoom back from all this kind of wiggly trampoline and jittery matter and try to come back to that original question. Why is there structure in the universe? An, an awfully compelling account that's consistent with all the latest observations to better than percent level accuracy is because space-time is this wiggly, flexible, malleable trampoline that can stretch as well as uh, uh, have waves on top of it. And we fill that, that trampoline with this very special type of matter that's just like the Higgs field that's just been found. We have a Higgs-like field that can't help but jitter, and that imprints these wiggles on the trampoline. Trampoline gets stretched, and here we are today, all thanks to cosmic inflation.
there are lots of uh, still open questions about inflation uh, or about the early universe more generally. So one might ask, what caused inflation? Or what happened maybe before inflation? Is inflation likely to occur? Or are there other paths the universe could have taken? And frankly, that gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. And there's vigorous debate and, and, and uh, strongly held opinions that don't always add up. So what's the, what, what's the state of the universe when we get to even earlier times? That's, that ties us up to a question for what's the way to combine um, Einstein's relativity with quantum theory. Is there a quantum theory of gravity? Is it caused by superstrings? Is it not? Are there, more than one, are there more than three dimensions of space? And so there's no shortage of, of important juicy questions that remain. And each of those ideas uh, can be pursued sometimes even to make predictions for what else we should see in things like the CMB. Inflation predicts other phenomena that, that have not been observed yet. So for example, uh, there are other kinds of waves that could skitter along that trampoline that would be gravitational waves, gravitational radiation, uh, which, which people have been looking for for years and years and years and still haven't detected. So different models of inflation predict different amounts of these early gravity uh, gravitational waves. And uh, it would be great if someone could find those. Uh, there are s other subtle properties uh, in, the, in the pattern of light in that cosmic micro background radiation, polarization, that astronomers are very avidly looking for, but it's just beyond the current uh, technologies to, to observe. So there are other signals, if inflation occurred, that should be findable, but people have not been able to find just yet, because they seem to be at a level just beyond the state of the art today. <laughs>